uh, today it's focused on um, uh, amyloids and we have two speakers, Emma Spa, who is professor in uh, Lund University and uh, expert in lipids. Uh, so model membrane and membranes out of equilibrium. And uh, she's going to talk in particular about the coaggregation of lipids and uh, alpha synuclein, which is the amyloid protein of Parkinson's disease. And as a second talk, we're gonna, uh, second speaker, we're gonna have Paul Bernardo, who is a CNRS scientist at uh, um, Montpellier University. And we works on intrinsically disordered protein. And so he will, talk today about uh, Huntington uh, disease protein, so Huntington, and uh, the structural threshold, the, well, the relationship between the, the number, the amino acid threshold and uh, the structure of the protein. So please, Emma, can you start? Yes, thank you. Uh, so my name is Emma. I am... Um, have uh, worked for uh, now have been interested for rather many years in amyloid formation and in particular amyloid formation in um, uh, or, or this aggregation process in a, in a situation where you have a, 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 an environment that also contain other molecules in particular lipids or surface active molecules I'm a physical chemistry in surface and colloid chemistry. Uh, and I, I, I would say I'm not an expert in, in neutrons or scattering. Uh, I, I'm focusing on these problems, but I have seen these methods as a, a powerful tool. And, 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 and I, I'm a typical user, I would say, rather than an expert. And the things that I will present is contain some uh, neutron data and scattering data, but it is, um, uh, uh, I would say, it's more focused on problems where one might think of uh, more or other uh, uh, experiments one could do with you, uh, exploring these methods. Uh, so, because uh, I think there are many possibilities in this system. So I will talk about uh, amyloid lipid co-assembly, protein lipid co-assembly in amyloid formation. And uh, the, the, I start with acknowledgement and here are some, some of the main people being involved in, in, in the work that I will talk about. Uh, so um, amyloid formation, as you probably know, uh, is, um, it's aggregation process uh, or it's a, a, a formation of, of fibrillar aggregates that uh, by protein that uh, have a, a characteristic structure and a beta sheet contain beta sheet uh, and so on. Uh, and this uh, process can basically occur for, uh, or this phenomena can basically occur for any protein in, in if they are put in sort of a condition where they are not <laughs> completely happy. Uh, and, um, but it has gained enormous interest because of its uh, role or potential role in several diseases, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. And here I show uh, picture, uh, electron microscopy picture of, of these fibrillar structures uh, and list some different uh, proteins that, that form amyloid aggregates. And, and, and the one that I will talk about is alpha synuclein, which is uh, a protein that uh, is uh, found in the so-called Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, still, I mean, the, the, um, the connection let's say that these alpha synuclein containing aggregates are sort of hallmarks, hallmarks for Parkinson's disease. If you have the disease, you have the aggregates, but you, there is not a clear understanding about what is the cause of the disease. But you see these aggregates when you have the disease. So, so this is 
since long and a very active field and still many open questions. Uh, there are some observations that, that um, uh, may be interesting in this context. And that is that, of course, this in the, in the biological system, this aggregation process takes place in the presence of, for example, membranes and other um, micromolecular assemblies. But, uh, and, and they may then influence or interact or associate with these other assemblies. And for membranes, one have seen that, that when aggregation takes place in the presence of membrane, it can cause leakage and disruption, that disruption of these membranes. And uh, there is also membrane associated processes that are sort of thought to be, be linked to the spreading between cells. So take a look at this process. We have an aggregating protein. I mean, the simple case is that you just look at the protein aggregated to form fibrils. Uh, that will happen for many of these systems without the presence of lipids. But in the presence of lipids, you can also have other things going on. You can have binding or adsorption of the protein to the membrane that can be con uh, sort of <laughs> a, a, a continuing aggregation process that can occur at the membrane or pick up components from the membrane and so on. Or that can be the association with intermediate states. So this is clearly a non-equilibrium process that is already, if you have only a membrane and a protein, it's, it's far from trivial. Uh, and of course, having this picture in mind, what's formed in the presence of membrane might be protein aggregates alone, but it can also, and that is part of my point here, uh, it can also be a co-assembly, so you can have an uptake of lipids into those aggregates. And if that occurs, it's of course another type of aggregates that form. It's, a, a, it's not a protein aggregate, it's a lipid protein aggregate, so it might have different properties in, in different ways. And it can also, um, I mean, the process, you can potentially affect the membrane by, by sort of picking up components from it. The, the, the fact that we can have this, that this is relevant, uh, we can sort of see uh, from both in vitro and in model studies. And here is an old study from our, our group where we basically uh, just indicate that there is a co-localization uh, or co-assembly of lipids and proteins. So here is a case, it's a sequential uh, set of images. So here we have, uh, in the first stage, a, a lipid um, vesicle with a red fluorescent dye. We add small seeds of peptide that have no label, but we have, uh, and the parallel experiments also confirmed that, I mean, these seeds absorb to the membrane and cause membrane thickening. This one can also stain and see that it is these seeds. And then we add peptide monomer, and you see the growth of something from the membrane from these seeds and that thing uh, now contain red, which is lipid and green, that is pr protein. So, so we see a co-aggregation process. If one look at the biological systems, there are also several observations of that when one look at plaque, uh, that these are not protein alone aggregate, but actually also contain lipids. So, so with this somehow background, uh, we, as I said, worked with this for many years, and I will not have, of course, uh, any possibility to, to, to sort of treat all these different aspects of this, but uh, I mean, I think one, one can see many, several, several, identify several interesting problems in here. There's one question that I will focus on a little bit that deals with the, the association of this monomeric protein to the membrane. How does this protein if, 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 it, if it's absorbed, how does it absorb and what makes it absorb? In what condition do you have absorption? Then we have a second question and that is that we now go on to an aggregation process. And there are many fundamental questions. Uh, so, so, so what drives this process and what are the energy barriers and so on? I will focus here I will only comment a little bit I mean, we, we, uh, on this alpha synuclein system. So, so 
you can have membrane systems that or other surfaces that trigger aggregation. You can also find situations where they don't. So what are the conditions that, that makes this happen? And then one can, of course, also continue raising questions. So how do then the presence of this membrane interfere with the aggregation process? And finally, we get formation of aggregates. That is the sort of last heading here, that we get something formed. What is that? Is it a lipid co protein co-assembly, depending on lipid system? And how is what is what do we mean by a co-assembly? Is it just that things are co-localized, as we saw in these fluorescence images, or does it mean something else? At what length, length scale do they co-assemble? Uh, um, so th that's sort of the the the, uh, this, the the disposition of the talk. I will uh, focus on the protein that we work with most, and that is alpha synuclein, uh, which is 140 amino acid long. Um, it, um, uh, uh, it, and it's associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, alpha synuclein is maybe nice in a way. It, 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 it is not very easily aggregating. So if you have the protein, monomeric protein alone in a situation in a, where there are no um, surfaces which can serve as sort of uh, where you can have heteronucleation events, the aggregation process is, is extremely slow. So you don't have aggregation within weeks. Uh, so, so uh, the, the, and this one can explain by that a nucleation event is, 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 is is the limiting step and it's, it's a very slow. You can, however, trigger aggregation by adding things. So you can adding, typically in, in some studies, experiments are done in polystyrene of holders or beakers or plates and, and or other materi surface material that actually trigger aggregation and also the air liquid interface. So one can have basically unwanted experimental conditions that makes aggregation a cure anyway. But you can also do things like adding preformed fibrils, seeds, or uh, uh, vesicles uh, to induce aggregation. And then it's so that if you have uncharged vesicles, they apparently, uh, basically do not do anything. But if you add charged vesicle, you can induce aggregation, but not every time. And this is another a thing that that sort of causes some um, uh, inconsistency or apparent inconsistency in the literature that that there might be contradicting results but it can actually be due to as i will come back to it it's it's extremely important what are the proportions of of the lipid and protein on whether aggregation will occur or not so that is the 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 protein that i will talk about uh, and I will then have this protein in, in presence of different uh, model membrane containing different lipids, those that are here, either switter ionic or anionic lipids. So I will then start to talk about this first part of this process. So, so when and how does alpha synuclein adsorb to lipid membranes? And when, under what conditions do, we thus, do this membrane trigger protein aggregation? And here we and others have studied uh, uh, this. That is, there are some things that are very well established. And that is that uh, the protein alpha synuclein adsorbs to anionic membrane, but not a strict ionic membrane. And when it adsorbs, it forms an alpha helix. Uh, then um, one can do additional experiment. Here we have done. Uh, uh, NMR experiment with a, a, a labeled protein. And, and basically what we do is that the blue, uh, with that the, 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 when protein is bound or, uh, or, or uh, associated uh, on a bigger object, it, it, the signal sort of um, disappears. So we can see what part of the protein that uh, uh, are, um, are uh, sort of membrane bound and not uh, uh, for different segment in the protein. And, and, and from this conclude that the protein, this the blue is the free protein, the red, 
the red and green proteinosomes in the presence of anionic vesicles, different composition. And we can say two things, both that the different lipid change, exchanging the anionic lipid is not important in this case, and in not in, in several other cases that we looked at, but that you see that basically the C-terminal is unaffected by the membrane, but the end the large n terminal and the middle part of the protein is what seems to be, that will get a reduction in signal. So that's what seems to be associated. So we have a protein that's sort of in part for bind to the membrane, that part from an alpha helix and the C terminal, which is actually com a com a very negatively charged, it sticks out. We also looked at this with a, a neutron reflectometry some quite now many years ago and to with the question of where in this membrane on the membrane is the protein sitting. Uh, here we used um, again anionic model membranes uh, and we uh, and the deuterated protein, fully deuterated protein in this case, it's um, uh, um, uh, um, and then three different contrasts uh, where we match out either uh, lipid or almost match out the protein. Uh, and, and from the uh, reflectivity profiles with a, a we call, uh, then uh, done in three different solvents, uh, we could we only looked at this initial uh, situation. So we, as I will come back later, work with condition where there is no aggregation because we have no possibility to do time resolved information. We are interested in how the protein adsorbs to the membrane and the data could be fit to a slab model where we basically uh, uh, divide the, the layer according to this cartoon. And based on, on this, we then uh, uh, could, could sort of model the data and uh, ending up with a, a profile, a, 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 a suggested a structure, or that where uh, where the, the the perturbation is only seen in the head group layer and the better out part of the of the acid chain, suggesting that alpha synuclein is not at all penetrating, but it is sinking down in the head group layer. What was also nice is in the, that the contract that match out the silicon surface actually also with this mixture of lipids actually also matched out the lipids so that the membrane become visible, which made it easier to sort of determine the distance between the protein and the surface. So from this, we have some idea of how the protein, how the protein goes to the membrane. It, uh, it absorbs the anionic membranes it forms an alpha helix on the membrane, but only in the sort of the parts of it, not the C-terminal part. And uh, it, the protein is not uh, inside the membrane. It's not sort of surfing really. It's in the head group layer of the membrane. Now I come back to this observation because I mean, here we somehow had a, a, a in a way, simple picture. Now we take a protein and add to the membrane and we did not consider really variations in conditions. So, but I pointed out something before and I said that, that we, there's something and then will continue to happen. So this absorption will happen anyhow, but if something then continues to happen, that will depend on what are the proportions of these vesicles and the, and the, and the protein which uh, uh, we have looked a bit more into. And here again, uh, we have done this kind of NMR experiments that I showed you before. So we have the free protein and then we had varied the lipid to protein ratio for the, the uh, 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 bit to 50, 200 and 100 and 200. And what you can see here is that by increasing the number, the amount of lipid, you basically lose signal in larger and larger fragments of the protein. And that tell you that it is more and more of the protein that's, uh, that seem to be um, larger and larger portions of the protein that seem to be associated with the membrane. So, so uh, based on these data combined with uh, fluorescent correlation spectroscopy data, we came up 
uh, with uh, the sort of uh, 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 model where, or this picture where we actually see that the protein at the high lipid protein ratio, the protein has a larger part associated with a small part sticking out. When you reduce the amount of lipids that goes to this uh, 50 and 100 situation here, you have a bigger part of the protein sticking out and a smaller part associated. And then at very low lipid ratio, you have vesicles fully covered and, and there will also be excess free protein that is not bound to the, to the vesicles. Uh, and then one can envision that these situation uh, actually are rather, I mean, they are rather different. So they can also impact a process in, in different ways. Uh, uh, and, and eventually we could of course also ask what happens if we add, add even more surface and the somewhat surprising result is that, and it, it's here illustrated by confocal microscopy study, but it, uh, it can all again confirmed with other methods that actually when we add more vesicles, uh, we have a situation where we have a sequential filling of vesicles. So, so it's not diluting on every vesicles, but it's filling, it's a strongly cooperative process. So it's, it's filling the, the vesicles first where, where you already have the protein that has been random coiling solution. It comes onto the surface from an alpha helix. And that is apparently lower energy to add to that already bound protein than to go to a bare surface as a, as a, a and bind alone. So, uh, so here we get a sort of a picture of really a variation in behavior depending on lipid protein ratio. And, and I think this is important to have in mind. It's not only mixing lipid and protein, but where you're then going to continue to think about what happens, these situations are all different. Before going on to the other situations, I will have one more question related to, to this. And that is now I sort of discussed what happened with the protein. It goes to the surface, it binds in different amounts. But if you then instead think of how does the vesicles, uh, how are they affected? Uh, we then did a, a neutron sense experiments on, on vesicles where, where we had um, a deuterated alpha synuclein to a level that is matched out in D2O uh, and uh, performed experiment with uh, uh, where we basically then only look at the vesicles, sense experiments, and then we could see that vesicles are actually uh, in the situation where you start, I mean, uh, where you have excess slippage, so then they are sort of less closely packed on the surface. You have uh, not, uh, you have also a vesicle deformation and, and formation of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, non-spherical vesicles, uh, which was then also confirmed for, for with cryotem. So, so again, uh, this is a situation. I mean, we see clear lipid-protein interaction. Some of these situation may be relevant to amyloid formation. Some of them are probably not. And as I said in the beginning, aggregation only occurs in the situation where you have an excess of protein. So this was here confirmed that aggregation only occur in this situation where we have free protein, while when you have all, basically all protein bound, there is no aggregation going on. So, so uh, 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 and then, I mean, so here we have uh, alpha synuclein is a protein that is naturally present. We have it. And it has a healthy function uh, being thought to be involved in nerve signaling and in, in the present, in, uh, present in the synaptic and, uh, uh, regions in the neuro, uh, neural cells. And 
with uh, 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 involved in process, potentially involved in processes of membrane fusion and fission. Uh, and and the, the, the events that we see with a, a strong association, cooperative bonding and deformation might have an impact on that, but not on aggregation. Uh, so so uh, here I, I, I think that, I mean, now we have characterized this with a bunch of different methods, but also with the help of neutron get uh, experiments get insight in how the protein binds and also how that influence the vesicles. And um, uh, so to, to, to sum this, we know how the protein binds to the membrane. Uh, it, when it binds, it, not, we, we, it, it changes its own behavior going from a random unstructured protein to a random coil, but it also changed the membrane it penetrates slightly in the interface and it uh, sort of causes vesicle deformation. Uh, and we also saw this sort of uh, uh, interesting phenomena of, of the cooperative binding. Uh, and, and these things may actually be important for other functions of this protein. And then we say that the, pro the protein only trigger aggregation in situations where uh, there are uh, uh, protein aggregation can be triggered if you have other uh, um, surfaces there, uh, which can be, uh, for example, lipid membranes. And this actually aggregation only occur in the situation where you first fill the membrane and then have vesicle uh, protein free in solution. So basically what the protein sees is the vesicle with a layer of, of membrane. The protein is not, aggregation is not triggered by a bare vesicle. Uh, aggregation is triggered by the membrane filled vesicles. And then comes what's form. And I will do this very fast then because I think I'm sort of almost used my time. So when this aggregation, if we now are in condition where aggregation occur, so what is it that is formed? And, and then one could sort of ask the question, when, what is, Uh, I got a question. I will answer it uh, maybe in a little in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, um, if uh, if we know, I showed some images in the beginning that actually when protein this alpha synuclein protein aggregates in the presence of membrane, you you see that you in fluorescence image microscopy images see co-localization. So you see that there seem to be a mixing of protein and lipids in the aggregate, but on what is that? On what scale is that? And there again, uh, one could use many different type of techniques to try to understand this process. But co-assembly can, of course, be in very different length scale. It can be just that they are co-localized. There can be molecular mixing. There could just be deposition on the surface and so on. From the fluorescence microscopy, we confirmed co-localization. Then from um, uh, cryotem, we can actually see that the, the there is an effect of the, of the aggregate on a smaller scale now than the, what we see with fluorescence microscopy. So here the scale bar is 200 nanometer. This is a bunch of fibrils alone. You get like a package of spaghetti. When you have the protein aggregated in the presence of lipids, you still get sort of fibrillar aggregate, but they seem to be more, uh, uh, less dense, more tangled. At higher lipid concentration, you get vesicles associated to the protein, uh, 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 and these are still tangled. So there is a clear dependence on, on adding lipid to the system and on the amount of lipid that we add. And even more, if you now vary the lipid system, changing between different type of charged lipid system on this lower side and here figure C, you can also see that the kind of aggregates that form strongly depend on the lipid composition. So, so I think just this tells you that this is a phenomena to count on. You have an aggregation process that leads to a product that depends on what on the lipids. That does means that the lipids somehow are involved in the pro process. Uh, as a last thing, I will, or I have two two more messages. As I mean, uh, so so. 
now we can say at this scale length, there is the morphology of this aggregate is different, but, but this doesn't tell you that there is a mixing within this crystalline structure, so to say, in the amyloid fibrils. It tells you that in some way, I would say that it hints you that the bundling and the surface property and maybe the rigidity of these fibrils are, are, are different. And, uh, that's what you can say from such a picture. So next, we actually did uh, some uh, sucks and wax experiments on these kind of fibrils, either on alpha synuclein or here with a shorter peptide that is the core, the minimal part that form amyloid of alpha synuclein. And uh, from sucks data, we could basically, for both these cases, say that if we have vesicle, vesicles where we basically see the bilayer, and, and the, the, the fibrillar aggregate, actually uh, the, 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 the data obtained for that sample where protein was aggregated in the presence of lipids is more or less identical to what you get when you take a linear combination of each of them. And which tells that the, 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 somehow the major structures are still there. And also if one do look at the wax spectra, the, the typical P characteristics for the packing of the, the cross beta sheet in the amyloid fibers remain, as you see here, after the addition of lipids. So we can say that there is a co-assembly, but there is not molecular mixing on that way. On the other hand, by doing NMR, we could uh, confirm that, uh, and here I have not sort of uh, maybe time to go into the, to the details, but by doing NMR, uh, we could, uh, in these figures, the blue spec, these are um, NMR spectra for a lipid co-assembled with, alone or co-assembled with protein. Uh, and the, the data show you that for, for if the, the red spectra is basically a signal from mobile carbons in, in, in these uh, uh, lipids, where all the peaks correspond to a certain carbon in the lipid, and the blue is from rigid carbons. And you can clearly see by that co-assemble the, the protein with lipids, you really see a strong effect on the, on the dynamics on, on the lipids. So even if the somehow bilayer structure remains, the lipids are far less dynamics. This is the, I mean, the key conclusion from this experiment. Uh, so, uh, and that, on that, we can then end saying that if protein aggregate in the presence of a membrane, we can have the phenomena of co-assembly. It happens spontaneously, and we see from cryotem that the morphology depends on the lipid composition, the packing of the fibrils and so on. This um, also, uh, we don't see a sort of disturbing of the, there is still signs of lamellar structure and uh, uh, we don't disturb the crystalline packing in the fibrils, but we see re, uh, uh, re effect on the lipids, reduced uh, mobility in the lipids, which indicates interaction. So this becomes a bit complicated, but the, the sort of summarized picture is that if uh, that, the, the picture that comes from this and that one probably uh, uh, there is more to, to look into, but that we have actually that the aggregates in terms of the crystallization more or less process that you get uh, uh, the solid fibrillar aggregate. That is a, a process, this aspect on this scaling, nothing is changed, but you have a co-assembly with lipids uh, seemingly that you have, the, the proposal is that we basically have lipids still in form of bilayer, but tightly associated to the fibril, likely on the surface. And we also see, uh, um, which probably then also, we see this tangling or less close packing of fibrils that, that may be due to the impact of differences in surface properties. So the proposed structure is something like this, that we have the core as normal with fibrils, but decorated with lipids. And there I try to sort of discuss different aspects of this sort of rather complex problem. What makes the protein bind? How does it bind? Under what condition is their aggregation? And what is it that forms? 
Uh, and I realized I had a little bit too much data to fill into this little short time. Uh, so I hope you ask me question for everything that was not clear. And there is already a question, but now I lost it. There, question and answers. Do you know if the protein absorbed is located uh, at a highly curved part of the deformed vesicles or on the flatter part? That's a super good question, and I don't know. Uh, I don't even know how to, to figure out. <laughs> we have tried to do things with uh, uh, antibodies with the gold label to see if we can locate it. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, that is a question that I really would like to have an answer on. I, I also, there are indications that there, this sort of vesicle deformation might actually uh, be uh, going, I mean, there might be this fusion and fission processes involved there. Then comes uh, another one. Um, so I'm, uh, how does lipid saturation affect the amount of protein inserted into the membrane? Uh, yes, uh, the, it seems like the strong, um, the absorption of protein to the membrane, if that is what is asked for. So there, there is one question, how does the lipid saturation affect the amount of protein inserted in the membrane? And then the amount attached or aggregated. And the amount of protein inserted into the membrane, I, I, re, I understand that as adsorbed to, to the membrane. Uh, and the amount absorbed to the membrane uh, is mainly regulated by the charge of the membrane. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, basically, the membrane is fully packed. Uh, so uh, I think you are more regulated by the sort of repulsion between the protein than th that you could pack in more by, by sort of making the attraction to the membrane stronger. I don't know if Anne wants to uh, sort of choose what questions to go on with, because there are so many. Or how do you want to organize this? Well, I think we can continue a bit, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah. So uh, uh, then I continued. Giovanna asked, since the interaction is so much dependent on lipids, how important is then the use of lipids in the right natural composition instead of simple mixtures of synthetic lipids to expect different behavior. So uh, yes and no. Um, there, there are different things that matters. And, and maybe one thing that I didn't point out clear enough is that uh, pH and, and salt, that's solution conditions matters also a lot. Uh, it, these experiments that I presented were pre performed in a mildly uh, acidic pH, pH 5.5, which uh, is relevant for some cellular compartments. In these conditions, I would say that all anionic membranes that, that we and others have looked at uh, have the effect to, to induce aggregation. So the protein doesn't seem so picky. So in that respect, I would say that adding an anionic membrane is important more, um, you can have a small variation, but the key thing is that it's an anionic membrane. In conditions where the electros, I mean, when you increase pH, the protein will become, have a higher charge uh, and, and the processes are typically slower. In these conditions, um, one, uh, and this is mainly based on, on uh, I mean, uh, literature, but, but as I understand it, there you have a stronger dependence on lipid composition, but the key thing seems to be that the more sort of hydrophilic lipids, so shorter chain or bigger head group seem to be the one that are more uh, 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 efficient in, in pushing aggregation, which are not necessarily those that are biological uh, relevant. Next question, how long does it take for aggregation in the presence of patchy no, I no, it jumped. In the presence, uh, how long does it take for aggregation in the presence of vesicle with a lipid composition seven to three? Was the aggregation obtained by shaking or not? 
So no, we never did experiments in shaking. It was all done in quotient, quotient conditions. Uh, it takes three days or so, uh, depending on the uh, total concentration of the protein, of course. It, uh, and, and, and if you have a higher pH, it, it can take forever. Uh, I think this is the reason why many protocols for alpha clean are with extremely heavy shaking or adding beads or doing things that should make things go faster. But of course, that's a risky thing because you do more than <laughs> adding beads. You create other surfaces or, or you in interfere with the process. Okay, maybe I, I see the other questions are uh, more debate. <laughs> so maybe... Yeah. And keep them for after the talk of Pau. And, yes. Um, I also had lots of questions, so uh, I'm sure the the, um, mm -hmm. uh, the discussion will be very lively. Thank you for this uh, talk, yeah. which is really full of information and really interesting. Mm -hmm. and, Thank uh, you. Now we're gonna uh, listen to Pau Bernardo about uh, Huntington. So Pau is a uh, Specialist more on uh, NMR and small angle in combination. So he will show us his work. Uh, thanks, Anne. <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks for the invitation and thanks, Anne, for the, for the introduction. Um, I would like today to, to show the, some of the progress that we have done in the last, let's say, four or five years in the study of, of Huntington and Huntington's uh, disease from a structural biology point of view. And, and the talk will be divided in two parts. Let's say the first part is the one that we have devoted more time, uh, which is uh, the NMR study of, of this protein. And the last part is the, our last efforts, let's say, to couple this NMR information uh, with a small angle neutron scattering. Okay, first, I would like to, um, I cannot pass this, yeah. So, so some words about Huntington and Huntington's disease. So Huntington's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder, which is characterized by the presence of large uh, cytoplasmatic and nuclear inclusions, so amyloids in, 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 in neurons. The patients, people that, that suffer this disease uh, uh, present involuntary movements, uh, dementia, uh, all kinds of psychiatric disorder until, until the, their death, in fact. And uh, the onset appears normally <clears throat> at the age of adults and, and, uh, and the death occurs after 10 or 15 years. So this is a kind of terrible disease. It's a rare disease, but it still is, is relatively common. And we have to classify this disease. Um, it's a disease that, um, that belongs to a larger family, which is called the trinucleotide repeat disorders. And those are disorders in which some of the small uh, segments of the, of, the, of the genes are repeated multiple times. And those repetitions, normally of three nucleotides, so a codon, um, normally can occur in both, in, in non-translated regions or in translated regions. When it happens in exons, so in translated regions, um, we have two kinds of diseases, the polyalanine-related diseases and the polyglutamine-related diseases. So it means that the protein which is formed is, uh, is, contains repeats of polyglutamine. Okay, there are nine of those diseases, among them the Huntington disease, which is probably the most, the most popular one, the most well-known. When we look at the protein that is translated from this, uh, from this gene, this is Huntington. And Huntington is a very large protein. It's like uh, 3,000 and more than 3,000 amino acids. That, and the, the crystal, um, no, sorry, the cryo-EM structure was solved very recently, or relatively recently, and you can see it here. However, this structure, which is uh, kind of remarkable, does not tell us anything about Huntington's disease because the polyglutamine repeat is at the end terminus, which is called the exon one, and this part is highly flexible and therefore does not appear in the cryo, cryo -EM density. So we didn't learn much about, about this. Let's, let's look more in detail. Let's focus on this, on this exon one, this fragment. And here you have the sequence. It's not very big, but you will see straight away that we have this blue region here, which is the polyglutamine tract. So there are plenty of those glutamines. So the people, uh, wild type, let's say, have something between 17 and 23. And, uh, and then there is the N17, which is the 17 amino acids that precede this uh, polyglutamine. And then there is a poly, poly, sorry, the proline rich region that contains several of those proteins, especially remarkable, these uh, two tracks of 11 and 10 uh, consecutive prolines in this, in this region. 
So Huntington, as the vast majority of tributyl repeat disorders, share two very, very interesting features. The first one is what is called a pathological threshold, which means that only individuals that have more than a certain number of glutamines will develop the disease. And in, this, in the case of Huntington, or Huntington disease, sorry, this is 35. So all individuals with more than 35 will suffer the disease. And there is another interesting feature here is that there is a correlation between the age of onset and the length of the polyglutamine. So it means that the longer the polyglutamine tract, the earlier the, the, the disease starts, okay? And also the severity. Another interesting feature is what is called the anticipation which means this is not a no, it's a non-Darwinian uh, transfer of information, which means that offspring normally have longer tracks than, uh, th than parents, let's say. And this makes that uh, generation after generation, uh, people that, uh, that, con that have this uh, congenital disease suffer the disease earlier, uh, earlier and earlier, okay? So, so which is the origin of the pathological threshold? So essentially there are two, two, main, um, two main, let's say, theories or, or uh, scenarios. The first one is called the conformation emergence model. And this uh, <clears throat> claims that the protein per se is not uh, toxic, but at some point after this pathological threshold, there is a new conformation, a new structure that emerges, and this structure is the toxic one, okay? And, and, uh, and this, is the, this is the model. The, the second model, it's called a linear lattice model. It's a slightly more uh, sophisticated and says that essentially per se, polyglutamine is toxic. And then, and then the toxicity keeps adding when the length of the glutamine uh, uh, increases. And then at some point, the body has no, the, the cell has not the possibility to deal with this, with this amount of toxicity and then the, the, the disease appears. So discriminating between these two models, I mean, uh, as a structural biology, seems pretty easy problem, let's say, because the only thing you have to do is to solve the structure in the non-pathological and in the pathological scenarios and see which are the differences. And nowadays, this seems even more easy because the three main high-resolution techniques, or the, the three high-resolution techniques, in fact, have improved a lot in the last decade, let's say, and they can solve the vast majority of, of the structural bi of, of biolog biological questions, let's say. However, we have to take into account a couple of details. The first one is that the protein is intrinsically disordered. So it's partially structured, but essentially it's disordered. Therefore, you cannot apply crystallography and you cannot apply cryo-EM as I said before. But there is another phenomenon, which is the compositional bias. So we, you have seen already the sequence of this protein and you have seen that it's rich in prolines, rich in glutamines, and this causes a big problem for nuclear magnetic resonance, okay? So as a consequence, as a consequence, let's say, uh, th there is no high resolution information and everything has been based up to now on uh, low resolution methods and molecular dynamic simulation, coarse grain, sim coarse grain simulation and things like that. And the present model is what is called a tal-like model in which the, the red, those red blobs there represent the N17 and the polyglutamine that kind of form a, a globular particle, let's say, from it and from it the poly, poly, the proline rich region sticks out to okay? me. But this is kind of uh, low resolution as I said before. Coming back to the compositional bias in NMR, why we cannot do NMR on this system? And you will easily understand that. So this is, this is a folder molecule, and this is the NMR spectrum that you have. And each one, each one of those peaks corresponds to one residue of the protein. In a folded protein, what you have is a very nice dispersion of peaks, and therefore it's relatively straightforward to assign them, to identify each one of the amino acids or the residues of the protein using this technique. Okay. When you have a disordered protein, Essentially, you have more or less the same, you have isolated peaks, but then, I mean, you see that the resolution and the proton dimension is much narrower and therefore becomes more and more difficult, but still it's doable if the sequence is not unbiased, let's say. What happens in Huntington, for instance? Well, in Huntington, you see more or less the same phenomenon. You see the peaks, isolated peaks, beautiful peaks, you can assign them, but if you focus on the glutamine portion of the spectrum, you will see that all the peaks appear in this kind of banana-shaped density. And this banana shape density is the same for short uh, Huntington, non-pathological with 16 glutamines and for 46 glutamines. So uh, you can easily understand that is it possible to identify one by one the glutamines of the track uh, using, using NMR. So essentially Huntington and other kind of uh, low resolution and uh, low com complexity proteins have been considered kind of impossible for a structural biology. And the reason, the reason in fact is that 
when you produce the protein, you know that in NMR we have to uh, isotopically label our protein with nitrogen 15 and or carbon 13. You do it in E. coli, and then you label all the glutamines, and then you have this kind of crowded spectrum. It would be much nicer if we could do something like that in which we could only label a single, an individual glutamine under control, because this, this will give us very simplified NMR spectra that, uh, that for which we can get the assignment and the structural information residue by residue, but also will be independent of the OMO repeat length. Okay, so this will be perfect. So in the next slide, I will explain how we have done that. Uh, it took us uh, some years to do this. And, and, um, and yeah, so, <clears throat> so you all know how uh, proteins are synthesized in, in cells. Essentially, the, the code of the sequence of the protein is coded in the mRNA. This mRNA is recognized by the ribosome, and the ribosome disentangles the, or decomposes this information through other molecules, which are the tRNAs. The tRNAs have the anticodon that recognizes the specific sequence on the mRNA and kind of translates information and synthesizes uh, and, and helps, let's say, the ribosome to synthesize the exact sequence that is coded in the mRNA. When it reaches to the end, when there is a stop codon, a stop codon means that there is no tRNA that recognizes its codon. There is a protein that is called release factor that comes, jumps, uh, binds bind to, to, the, to the, um, the ribosome and the protein disassembles and the protein is synthesized. Now let's imagine that we can do the following. We can take out the release factor and instead we put a synthetic tRNA that contains an anticodon that recognizes this stop codon. Then the ribosome will recognize this tRNA Will, uh, will attach it will, and will incorporate this blue ball, this blue amino acid in, into the chain. And when this assembles, this blue chain will be, this, sorry, this blue amino acid will be in the, in the chain. This technique is called tRNA suppression and has been used for decades for, to introduce uh, chemical variation or ke chemically modified amino acid inside of proteins. But they do in fact is introduce isotopically labeled amino acids instead of chemically modified amino acids, okay? So technically, we do that in the following. So we have commercial glutamine, labeled glutamine. We synthesize the tRNA with this uh, appropriate anticon. This tRNA comes from yeast. And together, I and mean, we put those two molecules in uh, together with uh, the, this enzyme, this, uh, the, the glutamine tRNA synthetase, we can load this tRNA with the amino acid that we want. Afterwards, we have the gene in which in which the position that we want to study, this glutamine, instead of the codon, normal codon of the glutamine, we put a stop codon. When we add those two elements together with a cell-free uh, mixture, the cell-free is, is an extract of E. coli that contains all the translational and, and, and transcriptional and translational machinery of E. coli. When you put all those things together, the ribosome will synthesize the protein and will reach it to the stop codon, will incorporate the blue amino acid and we'll synthesize the protein with the blue amino acid that will give us a very simple spectrum. By changing, doing different reactions with this gene change, with, with this stop codon move in different positions, we'll have the complete assignment. And this, in fact, it works. And here you can see the spectrum of the, the non-pathological version in gray and in blue, I mean, sorry, in this kind of uh, color, let's say, uh, we can see the first uh, glutamine that we have incorporated in this way. And we, have, we see only a single peak. And in fact, we have done that for all the, for all the glutamines of, of, this, of this construct, which is uh, the number of, is 22. And uh, we have assigned them unambiguously. Um, of course, as I said before, this is independent of the, of the, of the length. And we have done the same with a, with a protein that is, let's say, almost impossible to work with, which is the, the pathological version with 46 consecutive glutamines. And we have assigned few of them. And essentially, you see that the spectrum uh, look, uh, the spectrum look the same, and which already is a, a strong evidence of a linear lattice model, meaning that you know nothing changes when you increase the number of, of glutamines in your in your protein. Of course, we can do. We can do that not just for the NHs, we can do that for all the atoms of the, of the glutamines in both, in both systems. We can monitor the C alpha, C beta, C gamma, the side chains the, of the glutamines, and, uh, and this for the 16 and the 46 without, without much problem. So, <clears throat> so, which are the conclusions we extract from this, from this analysis? We, by, with, uh, by modeling or by, by, by using this, the chemical shifts, that, uh, the, the, the chemical shift of, of, the, of, the, of the protein, we observe, for instance, that the, the protein is, has a tendency, but it's not fully, but a tendency to be helical, as, as no, not fully helical, and it's more helical at the beginning of the polyglutamine tract, and the, and, um, 
and uh, and the salicity decreases with uh, along the along the track. And for the, for the sixteen, if we focus only on the polyglutamine track, what we see essentially is that this this elicity goes beyond that in the case of the sixteen. So once uh, I mean it it keeps being helical for the complete uh, polyglutamine track. Let's say it's complete, and and you see that uh, for the sixteen, which is the gray. Uh, shadow there is very different than the, for the for the 16, meaning that there is some elements that kind of break the list. So the natural form of this protein is to have a helical tendency. Together with uh, Juan Cortez, we did some uh, molecular modeling using the chemical shifts, and we ended up with a situation in which the scenario that we see is that there is a, a, an equilibrium between multiple helical conformations that contains helices of different lengths that probably form and unform and fold and unfold continuously. And the nucleus of this, of this helicity, in fact, starts at the N17, so the last residues of the polyglutamine tract. Sorry. So the, the, the residues preceding the polyglutamine tract. We can even get some very uh, naive uh, structural, uh, very uh, naive structural models that kind of reflect this this continuous fluctuation between helical conformations. We uh, we went a bit longer and we tried to understand how these helices are formed and how are they destroyed. And I'm going to go very fast with that. So um, essentially, what we what we identified is that there is a the canonical hydrogen bonds that initiate the helix between the last residues of the N17 with the initial glutamines of the polyglutamine tract. But in addition to those canonical uh, hydrogen bonds, we also have some additional hydrogen bonds between the side chain of the glutamine that folds back and forms this bifurcate hydrogen bond that stabilizes the, the, the elicity. And this before get hydrogen bond are protected or are, are, yeah, are protected from the solvent using uh, thanks to these uh, large hydrophobic uh, residues in the in the NCT. In this case, concretely is the phenylalanine 17. We can even prove that um, by, for instance, uh, doing mutations on this region. So mutating the last two residues of the of the flanking region and to glycines and we destroy completely the elicity or adding those two leucines enhances the elicity of the, of the, um, of the polyglutamine tract. And how does it stop? Well, it stops because there is a, a polyproline tract just after the polyglutamine and we have shown that this is extremely rigid and we have characterized it a bit and, and essentially this, this, uh, this rigidity in the extended form of this polyproline tract breaks the elicity, the natural elicity of the polyglutamine tract. This is the nice part of the story, the, <clears throat> but there is obviously there is a question is that NMR is a very local technique. So reports about the structure at, very residue, at the residue level, but it kind of loses the, the, the global information. And, and we wanted to correct for that. We wanted to um, yeah, complement the NMR information uh, and to get more structural information, more, more global information. And we thought that SANS would be the ideal technique. And for that, I uh, started a collaboration with Anne Martel, the chair of this of this talk, and also Frank Gabel, which are two of the, I would say, world specialists in science of biomolecules. And uh, thanks to the ILL, we could recruit a, a PhD student. So thanks to the PhD program of the ILL, we could recruit Samuel, who came from uh, Denmark, and 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 together, uh, uh, co-supervised uh, by myself and Anne and Frank, we initiated this uh, the project of applying. Uh, sent to uh, to Huntington. There, we would like to kind of exploit the, the, the incredible power of the techniques hosted in, in Grenoble, so the LL and the SRF, our knowledge on um, cell-free production, and also our knowledge on, on the structure of the system. Okay. Why, why SANS? No, I mean, you all know SANS and you know probably much better than me, in fact, um, that the scattering length of, of the, of the of the nuclei, I mean, of the atoms are different depending on the isotopes, let's say. And, um, and, 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 and the, the thing that we exploit and the vast majority of people exploit is the fact that deuterons and protons have a very different scattering length. So, so which means that uh, depending on the density, and you all know as well this thing, so depending on the density of protons uh, that you have in your system, you will have more or less uh, a scattering length density of the different biomolecules that you can have. The funny thing is that, of course, when you change the proton deuterium uh, ratio in the buffer, this, uh, there is an exchange of protons and deuteriums of the exchangeable uh, uh, protons of your biomolecule system. And some systems like proteins kind of exchange and there is some sort of a slope. 
And RNA is the same, while lipid that doesn't have uh, exchangeable, at least the, 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 the chain, let's say, doesn't have exchangeable protons, then uh, this remains flat. When the cross, the buffer, the contrast of the buffer and the protein, so the scattering length density, length density of the buffer and, and one of those biomolecules kind of cross, at this point, the molecule becomes invisible. If we think more deeply on that, but I mean, we can go to the, to the amino acid level. In fact, all amino acids will have as um, a different plot of, of, of a scattering length density. And we see, for instance, here that glutamine and proline protonated can be, can be uh, contrast matched, while the deuterated ones cannot. Another interesting feature is that proline doesn't have any kind of exchangeable proton, therefore remains flat along this plot. So this is the first point. The second point is the self -free. So I said before, so contains the, the transcriptional and, and translational machinery of E. coli. And so we can express a protein inside of a, an appendor, let's say. And this has been used uh, widely to express complicated proteins, uh, membrane proteins, toxic proteins, because there are no cells there. So in addition to the, the E. coli uh, lysate, we also have cofactor salts, an ATP generating uh, system, uh, nucleotides, the gene, of course, that we want to express. But the key point in this project is that we have an exquisite control of the or almost exquisite control, a pretty good control, as we'd say, of the amino acids that we put inside. So if we know which amino acids we put inside, we know which amino acids will be inside of the protein that we will express. And this will be key. So in a situation like that, so this is kind of a cartoon of our hunting team. We have the N17, the polyglutamine, the polyproline, and the GFP. We always work with the GFP attached because hunting team is a is an aggregation prone protein. So we can imagine situations by, by, by tricking a bit or playing a bit with, uh, with the composition of amino acids or cell free, we can, situ we can have situations like that in which we have everything protonated, but now we deuterate the polyglutamine, for instance, or we deuterate the polyproline, or we deuterate both of them simultaneously. So this is what we would call a segmental labeling. But we can do the inverse labeling as well. So we can work with the fully deuterated and then protonate selectively the polyglutamine, the polyproline, or both of them, okay? We have those kind of eight deuteration patterns in our system, okay? So then we have the structure. We have this kind of NMR, um, NMR compatible uh, structures, uh, ensemble of structures of, of, of Huntington, which is, contains around 1,000 uh, conformations. And, and we, can, we can write the scripts, in fact, that transform each, this ensemble so we can adapt uh, this ensemble to each one of the eight, uh, each one of the eight uh, deuteration patterns. It's very easy. We can deuterate in silico all the amino acids that we want. This is very, very easy and cheap. Um, so, and then if you have these ensembles with, uh, with the segmental labeling, what we can do, in fact, is we can, we can, we can kind of predict using available software like Chrysan, we can predict which would be the, the scattering curve for each one of those eight, eight, eight data deuteration patterns in each one of the buffer conditions that we want to test. It was six. So we have eight times six. We have a, a 48, um, let's say, theoretical conditions or conditions in which we can measure or, yeah, and we have simulated. In some of the cases like this one, for instance, you see that when you change the, the deuteration level, in this construct, in this kind of, uh, with no labeling, let's say everything protonated, you see that a systematic decrease and afterwards an increase at this. So there is, doesn't seem to be, to have a lot of information regarding the, the, the different sections of the protein. However, in this case here, in which we have deuterated prolines and, and glutamines, what we see is that when we change the deuteration level, we start to see other phenomena appearing. So it seems that, you know, that there is information there that we can maybe, we can maybe grasp. So if, if we also, we take, the, we take those conformations and we just look at the radial gyration of all those 11,000 conformations in each one of the conditions tested, and we compare the radial gyration with the Sachs radial gyration, with which you have kind of an homogeneous density, what we see is that the radial gyration uh, are different, so can change, can be different, just because the, the let's say, the mass that uh, the sun sees is different, is distributed in a different manner depending on the deuteration pattern and the buffer uh, conditions. And uh, we see that, therefore, there are more information, there is complementary information compared with SACS. We also see, a, op, an, uh, we observe a, 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 another phenomenon, which is the fact that some of the conditions like have a very dispersed values. And we, we have seen afterwards, and I will show you that, that this corresponds to situations in which you have a contrast match. Because even if you have 
um, segmental labeling, uh, what happens is that at some point, at some alteration uh, level of the buffer, um, you will have a contrast match. So you have a match point, sorry. And, um, and, and then uh, you will not see anything. You will not have signal. And this, for instance, in the protonated sample, of course, around between 46 and 66, depending on the deuteration or the segmental deuteration that you have. While in the deuterated uh, patterns, what you see is that you don't have contrast match, essentially, because the contrast match is above, for the vast majority of cases, for those three cases at least, the contrast match is uh, above 100, let's say. So, so we have a, a different phenomenon. But what is important here, and, and that's a bit different to the normal uh, SANS experiments, we, we don't want to have a contrast match. So we don't want, we want signal because we want to be, we want to analyze the signal. So we have to avoid somehow all uh, situations in which we have a contrast match. So how we, we will analyze this data? I mean, this is very theoretical for the moment, uh, and I hope you will not be disappointed with that, but we, we, we are trying to learn uh, about this uh, before doing experiments, and I show you our progress in this computational part. And so so the, the way we analyze this data is, is going to be through the, um, the ensemble optimization method. This is a very simple method that uh, I developed some years ago together with uh, Dimitris Vergun. And, and it's very, it's very stupid, it's a very simple approach. So essentially you generate a lot of conformations that kind of um, sample the conformational space of, of this molecule. Then the second step, you, you compute the, the SANS-SACS the SANS or SACS data of each one of those conformations. And then you have a genetic algorithm that kind of selects a super ensemble of conformations that collectively describe the SACS data, okay? And then you interpret this, this super ensemble that you have selected. So what we, what we did, what we wanted to see is whether or not the, 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 our data contain structural information that is valuable, that is, is, is relevant and, and, and is unique coming from SANS. And for that, what we did is we selected a super, among our large ensemble of 11,000, we selected a super ensemble of um, 1,000 structures that were very compact. And from this super ensemble, we computed SACS data in all of the condi experimental conditions. For instance, in this case, you have this theoretical, beautiful theoretical, theoretical SACS curve, uh, SANS curve. And then what we did is we, we kind of uh, add noise to, to, to make it uh, experimental like, and we submitted those scores into the, the EOM approach. And then we have different scenarios. For instance, we have the scenario in which we can recover this, uh, this. so in red, we recover the, the distribution of radio duration, meaning that the information is there and, we, and through EOM we can get it. You have scenarios in which you get essentially information, but you steal some artifacts. And you have scenarios in which you don't see anything. So this means a scenario that you don't want because there is no information about the overall shape of your system. And we did that for all the system. You have the matrices there for all the deterioration patterns and uh, buffer conditions and in two levels of noise. So uh, let's say a, a, a high noise, meaning a, a low quality SANS data set and a high uh, signal to noise, so a good and excellent uh, SANS uh, curve, let's say. And obviously there, there are differences, but essentially what is telling us is that there are regions, essentially those that are approached to the, to the match point in which uh, you don't see anything. So you can recover the information while there are others in which you can recover the information. And this is a very important piece of information for designing, for, uh, for finding the best experimental conditions to do, uh, to do in order to get information about hunting things. Okay, this is all the theory, but does it work <laughs> at least? So there are multiple problems that we have to face. And uh, the first one, we'll be able to, in cell-free to, um, to produce enough protein to do SANS experiments. We, we know that we can do enough sample to do, uh, to do um, NMR, but for SANS, SANS is a bit slightly more demanding. And the answer is yes. So here you have in green the, the purified protein and uh, it's green because we have the GFP and you see that it's green. So this is a good signal always. But then, and one thing that we realized straight, straight away uh, together with Frank and Anne was that um, uh, sex sense was a technique. So it's the, the measuring mode that we needed. And, and that, that was great because, uh, you know, uh, in, in, at, the, at the D22, Anne uh, developed this uh, coupling of uh, sex and sense and, and it worked uh, pretty well. So we have to have enough sample to do this. And, and that, that was the first experiments that were measured less than one month ago. 
um, from two constructs. So the one that is fully protonated and this one that has the proline uh, deuterated. Here you have the, the percentage of B2O, the concentrations at the beginning of the injection, the mode, of course, and the, the experimental time. You see, it's a pretty demanding, uh, it's a pretty demanding technique because we cannot reach very high concentrations, and because we are using seg sands. So we are pretty happy. And and here you will see we see those scores. You will see that the, um, experimentally the the is a the, of course the yellow, and you can see that the, the quality, especially for those two, is pretty high. Uh, it's less good for this one for the twenty percent of the two. Uh, but that was uh, because the sample was uh, of lower uh, concentration, and and uh, and and in blue you see which would be is not a fit. It's the comparison of this experimental curve with the uh, theoretical curve that you expect for those conditions. And you essentially you see that it's a relatively good agreement, but it's not perfect. And it's not it's normal that it's not perfect. So it's a very good agreement, meaning that we are going in the right direction. So meaning that that what we are measuring is not bullshit, but also. The fact that it's not perfect means that there are SANS provides additional information that is not coded in the NMR ensemble. So it means that there is a room for improvement, and we think that SANS will be able to provide uh, this information. So, so as a sort of conclusion, so for this last part, there are more, in fact, work to be done than conclusions, because this is the first, less than the first year of the PhD of Samuel. So, so this is the beginning of the project. So we can get some, some conclusions. So we can say that the segmental labeling is feasible and cell-free, and we can produce enough protein to do sex sands, which is already something. I think that, I mean, computational modeling provides a fast way to evaluate the information content of the data. And before maybe doing those expensive experiments and, and, and spending hours and hours at the, at the SACS beam line, I think it's, it's a very good idea just to, to model and what do, you, what do you expect from your, from your experiments and, and try to find the optimal conditions. I think that it's also important to see that different segmented label samples contain complementary information and can be exploited. And uh, it's also very reassuring, let's say, that the data measure is compatible, but not perfect, but compatible with the NMR derived model. And things to be done that, uh, that we, we have to do uh, still. Um, so we have to optimize the cell-free conditions to increase the yield, especially for when one label uh, glutamines. And this is something that we are working on. It's a very technical issue that we can discuss afterwards if you want. Um, we also have to demonstrate that there is information on the conformation of the polyglutamine tract uh, in SANS data, and this has not been done yet. So we have we know the compactness, but not this part. We have to identify the best experimental conditions to do the, the analysis. We have to evaluate the gain of simultaneously fitting multiple SANS scores. This has not been done yet. And, um, and we have to study pathological uh, constants. So, so just to before fine finishing, uh, this is the group that uh, in, in, at the CBS, uh, and and those are the guys that have been working in Huntington in a way or another. The vast majority working on the NMR part, but here I would like to highlight Samuel, which is the main character, the main uh, person behind this project, and Amin Sagar, who is helping him with all the computational stuff. We have lots of collaborations in this project, but for for the Sans part, I would like to highlight, of course. And, and Frank, because, uh, because they are the experts and they, they, they are teaching us how to do things and, and how, to, how to do it well. And uh, thank you all of you for, for your attention. Hello? Yeah, yes, thank you. So thank you very much, Pau, for this presentation. And um, so for the moment, there's no no more question. You, you that there were so many uh, information that people are saturated, <laughs> but there are questions uh, um, for for Emma that we haven't answered, and uh, especially a bit uh, debated questions, which are also applicable to to your work, Pau. Uh, especially the question about the reproducibility of work with amyloids. Um, so I don't know, Emma, you want to say something about this? <clears throat> so about the reproducibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
that's a very open question. So what I mean, <laughs> reproducibility of uh, what? So I think the the, the binding experiments are, are highly reproducible. If you say binding of a, a monomer to a membrane, that somehow you you reach a stable situation. Also, um, but I um, so the. And, and I would say that all experiments that I presented have been reproduced many times, but per definition, the kinetics experiment has to be the least reproducible because you are really dealing with something where there is a risk that you do something in the, I mean, that you have a process, you, have, you study something that is strongly depending on your exact sample pre preparation procedure. And, and there might a piece of dust or some evaporation or anything sort of interfere uh, with the results. So therefore these, first, these, all these kinetics experiments, I didn't show a lot, but, but I mean, these were reproduced very many times. And most importantly, one look for, if one say that alpha synuclein alone doesn't aggregate, it aggregates when you add seeds. It aggregates when you add, I, I see there are many questions on how sensitive is it to, to adding different lipid types. Yes, there is some differences for, but saying adding anionic lipids, it always aggregates faster. That's an, a clear trend. Um, <clears throat> that's the, the similarity in the, response to adding an anionic lipid is more striking than the difference between the different anionic lipid systems, but there are some small differences. In order to make them clear, one need to reproduce the experiments maybe 10 times or more, uh, and then look within each set of experiments for each preparation that you have the same sort of um, uh, type Maybe one cannot compare the exact time between what you did for a new preparation, day one, day two, and day three, but within each experiment, you have the internal comparison. So the times are roughly the same, uh, 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 but the trends are clearly the same of everything that we present. Okay, but on the technical point of view, the question was more, how do you control all the Parameters? Do you control well pH? I guess. Of yeah. course, pH, and temperature, pressure, air, everything. Pressure. Yeah. Of course. And yeah. uh, and do you pre-purify your chemicals or do? You so them? I think the most important thing is to pre uh, to to have to start with purely monomeric protein and pure. That that's the critical thing. Uh, uh, um, we don't pre-purify the lipids, but we uh, are, of course, very careful in handling them. You notice if you have uh, some, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, if, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, when things are very reproducible, when you do it several times, you sort of, um, uh, think it's not some random contamination that is important. No, we use lipids, the, but they are synthetic lipids with high purity as we buy them. Uh, for ganglucides that we work with quite a bit, uh, they are extracts, that's the way you can buy them, and then they are analyzed with mass spec before use. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question uh, is about the interplay between uh, lipids and, uh, and uh, protein. Um, so the question is, in your experiment, the protein enslaves the lipids, but in reality, the cell wall enslaves the proteins, don't they? Can you comment on that? Uh, so I, I would say both. It depends on where you look, right? In the beginning of the process, I would say that the mem enslaves, I understand as, as it, as that it binds or takes up or so, yeah? So in the beginning of the process, I would say that the membrane enslaves the protein. You really get a membrane that is closely packed with protein. Uh, and, so, so, and you basically drain the solution from the protein. If you don't have enough, I mean, up to a certain limit, and then the vesicles are saturated. Then the aggregation process goes on. In the end, you see precipitated aggregates, uh, and they contain lipids, both in forms of deposited bilayers, presumably, and so strongly associated vesicles that basically wet the fibrils so they are uh, de 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 deformed. Uh, 
if you look at these kind of, um, uh, I would say probably rather difficult to, 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 to do the experiment on the plaque that you extract from a patient, but it, it contains lipids from those studies that have been done. I cannot value what are the potential. I can see that there are difficulties, but I, I cannot value them really in doing this experiment. But there are many indications, both for Lewy bodies and other types of plaque, that they contain lipids. And then it's not any longer. I mean, that that is lipid that comes from somewhere. That's not the cell membrane anymore. So So there one could say that that, that aggregate enslaves lipids, yes. Uh, it, it does in our experiments that brings lipids down in this precipitate, but it might also actually be so that it does so in biology. Uh, but I'm not the one who's, who can, who can uh, sort of be very critical evaluating the difficulties in this experiment. Okay, thanks. I also had a question about this uh, cooperative binding. Mm -hmm. So, which mechanism is behind in your? I mean, it's uh, yeah supposition. Do you think it's lipid defect with well? Per, no, I, I I don't think so. It seems to be we have. I mean, so the finding is relatively new. It's now under revision. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, the first thing when we saw it, of course, we believed it was an artifact. <laughs> so <laughs> that you fill yes, some vesicles first and then the next. Then we repeated it for, for giant vesicles, small vesicles and deposited by layers and different methods. And it, it sort of, it, it was consistent. We also changed lipid composition and, and we can see these for, for, uh, for anionic membranes. So, so, uh, I believe in the observation. I don't have the explanation for it. I, if it was defects, I would still think you would get a random binding because they are randomly distributed. My and I think that actually what you have, when you have the protein in the solution, that is random. When the protein is bound to the membrane, it's an alpha helix. You have a different interface that the next protein can see. So, so that is probably a nice place to be, better than being sitting alone as your alpha helix somewhere else. That's how, I mean, but this is completely speculation, but that is in my head, head how I see it. So is the, the seat, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, the place which doesn't uh, uh, interact with the membrane, is it negatively charged as well? It's negatively charged, yes. So Overall, the, the protein is positive. Charges. It's never negatively charged and apparently sticking out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and overall, the protein is positive, uh, negatively charged, but the um, parts that fall forms alpha helix is less so, and it folds to have the positive residues in contact with the membrane. And it's also sinking down a bit. So I believe hydrophobic interactions are important. Okay. Mm. Okay, thank you. We also have questions for Pao now. So, about the uh, in vitro translation and deuteration, uh, so the, the question is, can you imagine a way to do it for something else and proline and glutamine and especially, I guess, something which is not... Uh... I think that the question by Franz uh, is that, um, so, so we... We can, I mean, we can do that because we have tracks of polyglutamine and tracks of polyproline, and that uh, certainly helps. But in any case, we cannot uh, discriminate that. Oh, so there is an effect of GFP, and there is an effect. You have to think also that in GFP there are prolines, there are glutamines. So now everything is a kind of of mix. So, so this has sense. Uh, this has sense if you, in fact, you can model uh, atomistically uh, the system. Then you can you can really uh, use your models in the in the right deuteration uh, in the right deuteration uh, pattern, let's say, and and this is the key point of the analysis. Otherwise, if you if you had to do the GFP invisible to get information on the polyglutamine, that would be almost impossible because because the contrast uh, so the contrast point or the match point sorry would be relatively similar. So, and this is the I think this is the key point of the approach, or at least in my opinion, is the fact that we have to use atomistic models. And, uh, and, and then we kind of deconvolute this complexity of signals coming from different sites using those models. Otherwise, uh, you, would not, uh, you would not succeed, in fact. 
Yeah, but I think it was just so on the on the labeling uh, using the first method that you showed with the stop codon transformed in the labeled uh, codon. Yeah, you could actually really um, label any piece of the protein. Can you put several of them to? Uh, after yeah, that, that's an excellent point. Uh, uh, and the answer is no. Um, so. so so we can do it with uh, glutamine. We have shown it to do, we can do it with proline and we have done it, but it's not published. And uh, we are working on that, in fact, with alanine. Um, so, so to do that, what you need is, you have to have a couple of tRNA and, and an enzyme that are orthogonal to the E. coli, e coli one, E. coli one. And, um, and this is uh, it's not that simple, let's say. And uh, we have succeeded for the moment for those three. This is the first point. The second point is that how many of those you can add uh, at simultaneously. We are working on that, but I mean, uh, beyond, beyond three, so the yield decreases systematically. This is uh, one thing, and already the tRNA suppression strategy yields one third less than the normal cell free. So you lose 66% of, or 60% of the, of the yield when you do suppression. And when you add two points, then it's even less. Mm -hmm. So, so for NMR, it's uh, working with uh, what we call we call uh, single molecule NMR because we have very low <laughs> concentrations. Uh, for NMR, it's okay because you only identify one signal, one peak, let's say. But for science, would be would be impossible. Okay, I see. Uh, Anna, you want to say something? Yes, I don't seem to have access to use the question and answer box. So the only option is to wave my hand. Um, I uh, wanted to well, I wanted to thank you both for really excellent talks that were quite different, um, but gave a huge amount of information. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering, uh, Emma, you alluded to this a little bit. Uh, uh, most of the, or nearly all of the experiments that we do with neutron techniques, they are on model systems or uh, single components or relatively simplified uh, mm -hmm. processes. Um, and, and, and we are sometimes criticized for the, the fact that this is very far away from uh, patients and clinical samples and, and even uh, real drug development uh, pipelines and so on. Um, uh, do you have an interest in or do you feel that it would be important for your research or do you have the possibility to, for example, access samples uh, that are clinical, uh, that are, come from patients, for example, through biobanks? Is this something that you would consider beneficial or usable in your research? <clears throat> we now work quite a lot with ganglicide. That was originating from a, a project where we actually had exosome extracted from, from uh, I mean, that, that was by uh, the complex material, so to say. Mm. Uh, isolated exosomes uh, that then uh, showed interesting effect that we tried to dig down what was the, the reason for that and that was turned out to be gang. Yes, and I remember I think the lipid composition was analyzed. Yeah, right. the lipid composition was analyzed and then we played to build up these model membranes by the extract, extracting components from the exosomes and building up mm. them by bit by bit to see where we come yeah. back. Uh, that somehow started something. Uh, so, so that is, um, I think one could sort of, when, to me, the question is difficult. You, you need to know what is your question, right? Yes. <laughs> and then... Uh, you can turn it, to, I mean, either you get inspiration from, from the biological system, like in this case, and, and, and then you learn from it, you pick something out, simplify it to study that mechanism, and then in the end, you might go back to see how that mechanism plays a role in the biological mm. system. That, to me, that is a very nice project to me, and, and when you have that exchange. <clears throat> But often, often you what you receive instead is a uh, hundred new questions instead. <laughs> yes, of you, course. Yeah. But it, I mean, so, it puts you on some new path. So, so, yes. so, so I, I think I, I really think there can be a strength if it, in combining the, the complex system with sort of digging out something where you can study in more 
uh, detailed in a controlled way and then like, so having this exchange. So this is, a, 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 yes, I can see that that, that is something uh, very valuable uh, when one do it because one somehow ha have a question in there. And Pao, do you have something to say for here? Uh, I mean, it's difficult, yeah, I see the point in, 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 in looking at uh, real samples, let's say, but uh, um, I mean, I guess that this is, uh, it doesn't fit to the things I'm doing in the sense that, I mean, normally this should be amyloids and, and there are examples of people doing cryo-EM of amyloids or, and, um, and even solid state and amount of, of amyloids coming directly from, uh, from patients, uh, obviously. I mean, the complexity is higher and uh, sometimes you cannot disentangle it. So, so mm. not in my case, I cannot, I, don't, I do not envision that. I mean, I cannot, I cannot do that, let's say. Yeah. Sometimes it's also about um, making more collaborations to the world where the, the real samples are being studied. And this is mainly yeah. usually pointed out as a means to create impact and connect the things that we do. Um, to the other things that are often perceived as far more important and impactful. Um, yeah. So I, I feel personally there's something here that we, we could maybe improve, but that it's, mm -hmm. it's by no means a simple thing uh, in, in practice to try to achieve. Well, I think that with this... Uh... Still encouraging, but not very <laughs> a sure statement. We are going to stop there. Um, we already lost a part of our attendees. <laughs> so, Pao and uh, Emma, thank you very much for your presentations. I think we've seen interesting labeling scheme and uh, labeling lipids, labeling proteins, and and we can go further with the lens project with this. Thank yeah, you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And goodbye.